We are back. Giants baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho. The host is Timmy Haller. How are you? Hey, Ralph. I'm doing well. Doing well. Good. Um, kind of had a bad experience last week. You missed the show. Um, the work you do is incredibly rewarding yet frustrating. And, um, I just uh, feel for you because your emotions are out there. And uh, if you want to talk about it just a little bit and um, tell the folks well, what happened. Yeah, what I'll do first is I'll introduce our guest tonight. Uh, Gary Davenport joins us again. Thank you, Gary, for joining us. Great to be here. Yeah, thank Always. you. Always nice to have someone that likes us enough to return. Um, that's a, a big plus, and boy, do we like you. Um, uh, Timmy, real quick, what happened? Hello? Yeah, you're cutting out on us, Timmy. Or I'm cutting out, or something's, something's Is here. this any better? Is that this is any better. better? Okay. Yes, it is. And I didn't discuss with Gary, with this with Gary at all, but um, you know, in the industry that I work in, there's there's uh, tragedy and, and fatality at times, and uh, you know, losing a client last week was a, a difficult situation for me. So uh, to overdose. So uh, you know, that's that's part of what you get with this industry and in the field that I work in, but um. To change the subject, again, Gary, good to have you back on. I appreciate you um, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're you're pretty crazy going at it right now and, and have yet to get to Phoenix for or uh, to Scottsdale for spring training. Tell us what you're doing these days. Uh, these days I've just kind of been busy with um, doing a lot of lessons and uh, working with some of the high school and, and college kids around the area here. We moved up to um, – the Sacramento area, so we're outside in Roseville now. So it's kind of a new area for us, and uh, we really enjoy it. And just you know, it's kind of it's kind of a down a down uh, period for me right now. So it's kind of just relaxing. It's kind of getting geared up for for spring training to start. When uh, when do you have to report down there, Gary? When is your report date? Yeah, minor leagues. Uh, they, we we kick off the twenty eighth, so we have about three or four days of uh, meetings, so all the staff meets, and we go over every player in the, in the minor league organization and try to just be evaluating what they need to work on, and so kind of everybody's on the same page. And then we'll start having our first uh, on-field workouts around the four. Okay. Nice. Gary, when nice. when you guys get together uh, as, a, as a group of coaches, scouts, minor league, all the minor league personnel, non-playing personnel do you guys actually do a rating of each player and like from one to however many guys are in the organization as far as how you rate them as uh your number one prospect on do you guys do that at all uh we we really don't rate um that's kind of not really our job to rate them um it's more they might ask us what what would be your no trade list and you know you could throw out there you know a few names and guys that you just would not trade but um you know that always depends too on you know what you're getting back to at the same time but um basically what we do when we go over we have the guys and usually the managers talk first and you know because they had them all season and and then if anybody else wants to kind of chime in on what they think they need to work on or um what they saw during the season then um then that's kind of their turn to talk after. Like, really, the managers are done talking. Okay. Are, may I ask, are there prospects that stand out to you that are not rated in the way that the organization rates them? Do you see things, um, because you've worked with these guys, um, either, you know, low-ranking prospects – uh, not in the top five, maybe the maybe the bottom thirty. 
Um, can you see that that there will be progression how, um, ahead of the organization because you're working with them? Well, when you're working with them, you're you're always hoping that you know some players maybe need to get strength or you know maybe they're weak in in a certain part of their game, and you know you try to improve those parts and you feel you feel it. You can improve some of the parts of their game, then that makes them a lot more valuable. And um, but I, you know, I think we're all seeing pretty much the same things. And the, and the guys that are really good, they really they stick out. And but you know, sometimes like a Duffy or someone like that, you know, just kind of slips the cracks, and and uh, you know they show up later. And I think um, you know, there's a few guys like that in the organization, and there's a lot of young players that they really don't even talk about. And you know. We have like some 16 to 19 year olds down in the Dominican that you know might be some of the best crop of infillers that I've seen with us. Oh really? Um, any any one or two names that stand out to you that you can give us an early head start, someone to follow? Well, you know the guys down there. You know we've just seen them a few times, and you know they're on the like I said they're on the young side and. Um, We'll we'll keep their names uh, under wraps still. <laughs> I, I don't want to give you give you their names. I don't want to put it out there. But uh, cover um, Gary, don't blow their cover. Okay. But, um, but my, la- my like, last uh, question A-ball. about all of this: There's a guy in the organization that, for one reason or another, maybe because his name is Rodolfo Martinez, he's listed at 22 years old, and there's something about his picture that makes me think he might be older than 22. I'm just curious. Has that crossed anybody's mind in the organization? He looks 28, 30. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, from I, I think there's a lot better um, controls down in, the, like I said, the Dominican, and, and they really have to do a lot more proof of what they age. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, he, you know, he looks a little older, but, uh, you know, he you know, I'm not one to say he's older or not older. I, I still look pretty young, so you know, no, I, I would hate everybody to, to say that I looked older than I than I was. But um, you know, here's a kid that throws 100 miles an hour too. I mean, this kid that's what I legitimate, mean. Yeah, legitimate uh, arm. Uh, uh, with a live arm, I understand he's gotten some. Um, so he's going up pretty quickly. Uh, let's let's just put it that way. Um, Timmy, take over. Yeah, you know, Gary, I got a couple questions, and and I know uh, what a great opportunity it's been for these guys to work under your tutelage. You've you've touched a lot of guys uh, over the years. Now, what you're going on your 14th year with the organization? Yeah, 14. Yeah, and so. You've seen a handful of, or a couple handful of guys get to the big leagues, some successfully and some had their struggles when they got here. Um, this coming season, what are your, uh, impressions on Christian Arroyo and where do you think he fits into the scheme of things for the big league club? Yeah, I, I really can't speak for what the front office is thinking for Christian. I, I can only say, give you my opinion. Um, you know, Christian for me is, um, he's a fantastic ball player. I mean, he probably can hit an outside, uh, fastball about as good as anybody I've seen. And he's played, uh, short up until this point, And I don't know if he's going to keep playing short, but, you know, uh, in double A, they had him, uh, a few games at third, a few games at second. I think they're kind of thinking Christian is a, more of a um, uh, a protection in case anybody from the the big leagues go down, any of those you know front front line guys. So I mean, he could play short, he could play second, he could play third. You know, I've never I haven't heard any discussions about left field. I know uh, it's been brought up in the media a few times, but. Uh, he's a he's a really good athlete. He's young. Um, you know, there's there's no need to rush him. Um, but you know, a guy with his talent and uh, you know he'll he'll push his way through. 
and I, I you know, he's him and you know Tyler Beatty are probably our top two. Right, top back. right. Are you talking about him at Double A starting out. Uh, I, I bet he starts out in Triple A this year. Okay. But they did they did make a lot of uh, minor league signs too, so I don't know how that's going to affect them because I know they got uh, uh, Aaron Hill and. Um, uh, Jimmy Rollins. They signed Jimmy Rollins to uh, yeah, Jimmy and the minor uh, league and um, Becker too. Yeah, Becker. Be- uh, Becker's back. Uh, Beckham or Beckham's back Beckham. as well. Beckham. And I think that uh, you know, amongst those three right there, the veteran experience, et cetera, one of those guys is going to make the club. And they'll they'll break camp with the team. You'd think they would anyway. I don't think they're 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 able to handle all three of the guys, but one of those three veterans will make it. When you look at left field in the big in the big scheme of things from the big league level, um, how do you see that shaping up with um, Parker and Williamson? Do you think they'll be platoon quite a bit? Um, yeah, you know Parker. He's a he's a funny guy. Even in the minor leagues, he was like he could get really hot and he could get cold and. Um, He's one of those guys. When he's hot, I mean, he's I don't care who's throwing. Um, so they, they might just keep them both up there. Or, uh, I, I think one of them's out of options too. It might be Parker. I think Parker's out of options. So right. yeah, I don't know. I think they're both going to be fighting for a job in spring training. I think they'll pro- both probably be up there, and I think they'll try to put them in situations where it's you know, most advantageous for them. Right, so their greatest success. Well, yeah, I think they'll, they'll wait and see. I, I think they'll give them a good chunk of the season, too, to see what they can do. And, sure. you know, at a certain point, they'll say, yeah, we'll just keep going with that, or, you know, they might have to look somewhere else. But I think they're definitely going to get a chance to, uh, to prove what they've got. You know, it's funny you mentioned that about Parker. I remember at the end of the uh, – 2015 season, he got called up, and he what? He hit five home runs in a matter of had two or three days, and you know, had three uh, three in a game. Yeah, and that was over in Oakland, I think. He hit those in Oakland. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you come up to the big leagues and you make a splash like that, it's an unfortunate thing to a degree because then everybody expects it. Um, it's kind of like watching this kid Sanchez, the catcher for the Yankees last year, break in and hit 20 bombs in 53 games or whatever. And that's, I mean, as as wonderful as that is and as great of a, a little run he had, it's not realistic. He's not going to come out this coming year, I don't think, and have anywhere near the same impact he had last year. You know, and it's too bad because you get off to a hot start like that, then everybody expects you to play that well. Well, with the age of, you know, film and media and the way they, you know, dissect everything, I mean, they're always looking for, you know, flaws in your in your swing and, and weaknesses. So, you know, maybe they'll be testing some of those things, and they may be paying a little more attention to them now too. So, uh, you know, that league makes adjustments, and then he just have to, you know, readjust again, and that's all part of it. Yeah, and that's indicative of how really good you are too. I mean, if you're able to adjust and change, you're going to stick around for quite some time. Right. Well, that's why I would. That's what makes players great, too. Yeah, I just tell the players too. I said, you know, you don't have to be the best guy out there. Just you have to keep improving all the time, and and the guys that keep improving just keep going up the ladder. And you know, as far as the minor leagues go, and, and, and there's something to learn on each level, and you know, there's challenges that's uh, that's given on each level of each, you know, uh, the A ball, double A, triple A. I mean, there's things that have to overcome on each on each field. So, you know, they have minor leagues for a reason, and there's not too many guys that have blown through minor leagues. And we had a couple of guys, I mean, but, um, you know, there was need, too, for them to, to move that fast. So that kind of helped as well. Right. So, Gary, Gary, what specifically do you do now with the club? You're you're an instructor in the minor leagues. You work mainly with the infielders. Is that correct? Yeah, um the last um last year uh, I started working with uh infielders uh hitting uh you know I could kind of touch into outfield and you know base running whatever 
you know, they felt like uh, the team needed at that point. And I usually, what I do is I go into town and I'll talk to the managers and I'll see um, who needs what kind of work. And, and then I'll talk to the kid and see if they kind of match up. And, and then once, you know, and then I'll watch him play a little bit. And I'm usually in town for about five days. So, you know, I get a chance to see him in, in game situations and kind of evaluate him and, and then work with, you know, what I think that uh, needs to be done. And I kind of talk to our uh, hitting coordinators and our fielding coordinators and kind of see what they're, you know, thinking too at the same time. So everybody's on the same page and we're doing the same thing. Yeah, right. Now, you're on the road all the time then. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's how. Go ahead. I was just going to ask Gary, what are some of the techniques, that, coaching techniques, that your dad, uh, anybody that doesn't know, um, terrific ball player, Jimmy Davenport, great giant. Um, what are some of the coaching techniques he passed on to you that um, you think about on a regular basis when you're dealing with these kids? Uh Thanks for bringing up Dad. Um, actually, uh, Dad passed away a year ago today. So, yeah. Oh, um, really? Oh. Yes, it was uh, February 18th. Uh, things I've learned from Dad, I mean, just being around him, uh, you know, you pick up stuff all the time. And, and Timmy knows being around his dad and, and being around the clubhouse. It's just, you know, there's so much information that's, you know, out there. And you just kind of – look at your own certain fields and for me I was always really interested in the hitting and the fielding side of it so you know, I really paid attention when you know the Maces and the and the you know Bobby Bonds and Dad and you know uh, Joey Malpatano and these guys start talking you, you know you, it's like EF Hutt and you start listening and you just kind of hear what they have to say and then you know kind of put some of this stuff into practice and uh, I've been fortunate to have some pretty good uh, uh, managers that I was kind of with to to pick up some of their instruction uh, to work with some of these kids. And, uh, you know, and you never stop learning. And Dad always used to say, too, it's like the day I, the day I um, think I know everything is the day I get out of baseball. And, you know, uh, and it's true. There's always there's something to learn all the time, and, and there's – little things to pick up and uh that's what we, i love when the big league guys come down and uh talk to the kids just because they give the kids a possibility you know they might say one or two things to the kid that might click and uh you know you can't let your ego get in the way and you know it's all about the kids anyway and it's all about them getting better so you know you have to put your your ego in check sometimes and you know these guys have these guys have done it i i didn't play in the big leagues and yeah, but I've been around the game a long time, and and I, I feel I have a lot, lot to offer these kids. So, like I said, it's can all about. Can you give us an example of somebody you worked with early on who really benefited from your communique and went on, or um, somebody you really liked and uh, took pride in their progression? I mean. I've always liked, you know, I used to, I worked with all the infielders and hitting coming up. So, you know, Belt, uh, you know, one of the guys that come to mind and, and, you know, I always felt in, um, in a ball, there was a certain way that they pitched the left-handers and, you know, we talked about it a lot and, uh, he really used it into his approach and it, and I think it really made him, um, you know, a better hitter. And when he got to the big leagues, you know, he was – he had to make other adjustments when he got to the big leagues. So, but, uh, I, you know, he, he, there's so you many guys the that talk to the After kid. you came in you, and worked with him, you saw the progression, in other words. And, well, yeah, he was, he was pretty good when we first got him. So it's not like right. I gave him any uh, – but, you know, you, you work with the kids and, you know, I always feel that. And, and, and Dad always told me too. He goes, he goes, Gary goes. If you know, once you get these kids, and and when they leave, and if they're better when they left, then you did your job. So you know, all you can do is try to make them a little bit better, and you know, try to get them up to the next level, and you know, and just kind of 
strengthen their strengths and, you know, try to work on their weaknesses. And, you know, there's not a lot of changing going on. It's always little, it's always little things, but the little things add up. So. Right. 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 Yeah. That's a very good point. Um, also, so much of it is mental, not just physical. What do you pass on to them uh, mentally um, on your – you're a rover, and you come in, and you've got time with them. And basically, there are two coaches in, in most minor leagues, especially the, the lower minor leagues, two coaches for like 25 guys. So you're – you come in and you're showing attention. They're getting more attention um, in the time that you're there. And it's not, you know, there's a lot of time off the field. What do you, what do you pass on mentally off the field to them that helps them along the way? What are some of the things about coming? Well, actually, we've got about four to five coaches on every level now. So, oh, really? I mean, and then we, and we have about five rovers so we have like an outfield base running rover we have an infield rover we have a hitting rover catching rover so these guys are all we're going around all the time and um okay then um i'm behind the times uh, well yeah you know, there's a lot more coaches than there used to be believe me i mean when Timmy and i when we yeah. when we nope. Yeah, Gary, when we played, we didn't, we were lucky to see a coach drive through town once a season. Oh, yeah, that was the, we didn't even have a hitting coach. I mean, it was just, we had the manager, and usually the manager threw all the batting practice, and, you know, you might have a pitching rover and a hitting rover kind of moving around, but that was about it. But now, you know, I think with, yeah, with, with the White Sox, it was Funny because, you know, we really had some great tutelage. We had two roving uh, minor league hitting instructors. One was Dick Allen, the other one, Jose Cardinal. And I got to see those guys like twice each during the season, which was nice. Uh, right. And, those and, and, and then, but never, never had a infielder instructor come, not one infield instructor ever come. It was all about hitting the ball. I mean, the philosophy back then was if you could hit, you would play, you know. And a lot of guys were getting overlooked just because they could play a little bit of defense, but, you know, they were 210 hitters, you know, at double A. Yeah, of course, that's kind of cut it. It's a little different now. Yeah, um, they sure are. I, I, I tell the players, too, I said, you know, if you're in the minor leagues and they call you up to the big leagues, so don't be, don't be patient with a, a young hitter. But they will not be patient if you can't field the ball. If you can't field, they'll tell you to go back down to the minor leagues, learn how to catch the ball, and come back. Yeah. But they, they, they won't be a little patient with your heading. You know, I, I, I agree with you now. I think the whole complexity of the game has changed a lot in the last maybe two decades in regards to that. Obviously, in the 90s, we were looking at guys hitting 60 home runs a year with some regularity, but it was a different era. And uh, the guys that hit those home runs weren't that gifted other in other aspects of the game. They were pretty much one dynamic, you know, one one personality player. Yeah, one dimensional. Um and now you look at guys that they're very uh they're very patient in the, the development of these young kids and working with them and getting them ready for that level uh, at the major league level because we see how competitive it is it is now too. And um you know, guys that were, you know, regarded, even this year in the free agency market, guys that were regarded, you know, with some talent, um, some of them haven't even signed yet with any clubs because of the way these minor league systems are being, you know, developed and, and these young kids are getting a chance to play. Some of these veterans aren't getting a shot to play again in the big leagues. And they thought they were going to stick around for a nice fat payday. just purely be a financial move. We're going to sign a guy to X number of dollars as to bring bringing a kid up as opposed to bringing a kid up for the minimum, which the minimum is five hundred some odd thousand dollars. So um, it's all gotten away from us in terms of of the bucks and the you know. Maybe Gary, you can help me with this. I've got a problem. When do you guy when do you sign a guy like Napoli for eight and a half million for a year? 
going back to Texas, and then you sign this guy in Toronto who was – all he did was cry and moan about – him not getting the money that he felt he deserved. He's getting eighteen and a half million a year for the one year. Um, I think. <laughs> I mean, what do you think? That's. I mean, there's a disparity of ten million bucks right there. And I think Napoli is the better ball player. He's a winner. I mean, what are these executives doing in making these decisions, man? It's crazy. Well, they, they have. Um, you know, there's so much information uh now and even when even when uh you know a team comes into town you know they'll give all the players uh you know you know a book about you know an inch and a half thick of just uh tendencies you know who's hot who's not who's doing what what they what they did against you last time i mean there is so much information that they've broken it down so much but, you know, it, it, it's not just about, you know, what you see on paper a lot of times. You know, to me, what makes the difference in some of these kids is what they got inside. I mean, like a Duffy. I mean, you look at him, and, you know, he's probably, you know, an average player in the minor leagues. And then all of a sudden, here the kid is. He's, a, you know, number two uh, position for, you know, rookie of the year. But, um it has a lot to do with what they have, you know, inside, and it's, you know, the mind and heart and, and you know, the effort level, and some of them play with a chip on their shoulder, and some of these guys are really talented, and they think that's enough, and, you know, I think it takes a lot more than just talent to be, you know, a, a constant person in the big leagues, so there's, there's a lot of factors, and it's not just what they're putting on paper, and but, uh, yeah, the value of the money they give them, it's, yeah, it's unreal. I mean, but um, the market kind of dictates who gets what. And, you know, they can take them to arbitration. Like everybody that went to arbitration got $18 million. So, you know, it, the money's crazy, but, uh, you know, that's, that's just part of it. Okay. It is. I we don't, we don't have that problem. My, in I think I formulated my question a little bit better. Do you see a difference in, when you see, say, the top 30 prospects on the MLB site for the Giants, and you look at the top 30 listed in a row, can Mm -hmm. you see something and you go, whoa, that's not right. That guy shouldn't be seven, and the the guy who's 23rd should be seven, and the guy who's seven, 23rd. Will you see it, and it's so obvious to you, that you wonder who's putting the thing together. That's my question. Well, sometimes, you know, these guys are are seen by, you know, maybe people in the front office at certain times, maybe when they're really hot, and then maybe some of these other guys were seen when they weren't so hot. I mean, I look at the top 30 list, and, you know, I think the, you know, the best guys are on the list. It's just where they are could be evaluated differently, but, you know, who I think might have a more upside, you know, maybe maybe somebody else sees something I didn't see or, or you know, I see something that maybe they didn't see. It, it's just, you know, it's a matter of an opinion sometimes. And then okay. it all plays out. In other out words, again. it is so subjective that there could be a variance of that many positions in terms of one guy should be seven and one guy 23, just as an example. Those numbers. Well, yeah, like Today he's 23 and tomorrow he's 15. I mean, you know, is he going to be getting better? Um, you know, I, I look at um, some of the players that were really up high and now they're kind of falling off the chart. So, you know, you're going to see guys going up, going down, and it's just a matter of, you know, pro, uh, you know, production, what they do on the field at a certain point. But then okay, they, they, now- they project some of these young kids high. And then they see if they grow into that spot or not. Do some of your your talents as a player development person transcend into scouting? Could you have a career in scouting under different circumstances? Uh, me personally? Yeah, I'm just uh, you personally. 
Do yeah, I mean, I think we all have an eye for for talent. It's just a, you know, I, I just prefer to be on the field. I like the instructional side of uh, baseball. That's I think I've I've been programmed from an early age for the instructional side. I think it'll, okay, you know, I might there get to are some point. that do both. I remember Grady Fuson with the A's. Uh, was managing a ball in the in the summer and scouting. Uh, Tom Kochman was was another one. You haven't done both in your career, am I am I correct? No, no, I haven't. But we okay. We write reports on people that we see, so we can add to the scouting list. But it, they're they're a whole different level. They might go to you know two games. You know, and, well, amateur ball, they might be seeing two, three games a day where, you know, we'll see, you know, a series of uh, players for maybe, you know, three or four days. Right. But we do reports on all our guys, too, as well. Anybody yeah, they're, we they're totally separate capacities, right, Gary? I mean, your job, your job is to coach and to teach, and then they have a completely different scouting department that evaluates and reports to – you know, but the higher up. On, right? on some they level, want, they work together in the organization. I'm sure they work together. Well, we had uh, Joe Strain back when I was uh, my first year coaching in uh, 2004, and he was the rookie league manager, and he also yes, he did was. four I, corners. He was up there that year, up in uh, in Oregon or Washington. So he rather. he was doing scouting during you know amateur up until. You know, the season started, and then he went into the baseball season, and after the season was over, he went back to scouting again. But, um, you know, I can't think of anybody that's doing that actually right now with us. But we have the path. Okay. Jimmy. Yeah, you know, um, I just got a phone call. I've got to run here, guys, in a minute. But, Gary, I wanted to thank you again for joining us, especially – at such short notice and getting ready to head down to Scottsdale and um, do your do your magic with these kids. Um, I've had the good fortune of being able to be around on a couple of occasions when you were teaching and, and um, working with young guys, and uh, it certainly was a privilege for me. I, I still wish that when we were younger I had an opportunity to hang out with you even more than I did. But it's always good having you on, and I appreciate you taking time out to be with us tonight. Uh, Tim, it's always a pleasure. You know, you're, you're family to me. So, yeah, and and I want want to, yeah, give my love to your family and your ma especially and your knucklehead brothers. And, uh, you know, just uh, know we love you very much. Well, I appreciate it, Tim. Love you, too. Oh. Man, this is nice for me. Thanks for being here, Gary. And uh, to me, as usual, uh, it's a pleasure. All right. If you want to give me a call, you, you give me a call right on in spring training, go ahead. I'll be down there. Uh, you and I are going to be bunking one night, I have a feeling. So um, yeah. I'll be looking forward to calling you and, and checking in with you, buddy. Looking forward to it. All right. Be well, everybody. Thank you, Ralph. I love you. Thank you for the great show, Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. Pleasure to have both of you in uh, in my life. Thank you very much. <laughs> very much. And have bye a good bye night. Bye. Very, very bye. Nice. bye.